So in the last video, I promised to give you an update on uh, what I've been up to this summer. And uh, so that's what this video is going to be about. In, uh, in August, I gave a talk at a conference. Um, it was the 44th Annual uh, International Institute for Integrated Human Sciences. And this was a science, science meets spirituality conference. Uh, it was in Montreal, and it was uh, oh, it was a really good time. It was a really great conference, and I was invited to speak at this conference. And uh, so the title of my talk was The Mandelbrot Set and the Principle of Incommensurability. So what I did was I combined the principle of incommensurability with what I know about the Mandelbrot Set to... Um, to show and explain how I plan on uh, unifying um, physics and unifying basically all the fields of science. And, uh, and it's a general unification, it's not a specific unification, but I talk about this in, in my presentation. And uh, well, I did kind of sign a contract and I promised not to give the exact same talk within a certain time period of giving the talk. And so, um, but I'd really like um, to share this information with you all. And so what I did was I um, scripted my talk. And then uh, uh, this document here that I'm showing you is basically my script. So rather than make a video, which I promised I wasn't going to do, I am just going to give you access to a PDF version of my script, uh, which has all my slides and basically word for word um, explains what I said during the talk. And so um, it's quite detailed. I think there's like, I'm not, there's a lot of slides in here. And so, but they're all fairly simple. And so basically the text in here is what I said, and these are my slides. And I, I deal with a lot of topics like consciousness and um, the fractal paradigm. And so I thought you might be interested in this. I will leave a link to this in the description so you can um, check it out. At this conference, I met a gentleman, a man named Amit Goswami, Dr. Amit Goswami, who goes by the uh, moniker uh, The Quantum Activist. So here you have Fractal Woman and you have the Quantum Activist. And um, I did try to a little bit present a bit of my work to him. I gave him a copy of my paper, The Mental Brought Set as a Quasi-Black Hole, which I believe is here. So I gave him a copy of this and I gave him a copy of my script. And so uh, I gave him a copy of this. And so I don't know if he got around to reading it, but I did set up an interview with him for October 17th. And so if, if, if all comes through, I will be having a nice conversation with him, which I will record and hopefully be able to make a YouTube video about. So, uh, so that's pretty exciting. Um, he uses quantum mechanics to, um, to unify things and to bring things together, to bring concepts together like the mind and the ego and the spirit and most importantly, consciousness, which is really the elephant in the room when it comes to science meets spirituality. So that's, uh, was a big part of what I was doing this summer. It was an hour and a half lecture I had to spend a lot of time getting my thoughts together and deciding what I was going to say and then mapping out my PowerPoint presentation. And so that's why I have been so busy. In June, in June, I presented my Mendelbrot set as a quality black hole paper. And I also presented the ferro cell to Dr. Neil Turok, who is seen here. Now, this picture wasn't taken in June. This picture was taken a year ago, uh, the day after Stephen Hawking died, actually. Um, I'm seen pictured with him here on March 15th of last year. 
And uh, that's when I started to plant the seeds of setting up a meeting with him. And it took, you know, it took a year and a half to get that uh, worked out. But finally, he agreed to meet with me. And, and you know, we spent a, an hour and a bit together uh, talking about, you know, my ideas that I wanted to present to him. Um, Neil Turok was the director of the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, which is a, a wonderful institute. It's, uh, they have public lectures and they do a lot of things, um, outreach things for the public. And so they're more than just a uh, research institute. They are basically a university. They're affiliated with Waterloo University and all the best people go there. So uh, it was very exciting and really uh, humbling to have this meeting. And, uh, but I think I pulled it off really well. I was very confident and said what I needed to say. And uh, so we'll see if anything comes of that. Okay. Um, also, I just wanted to point this out to you. Someone sent this to me. It's sort of a sketch of uh, Eric Dollard's next book, um, called Electromagnetic Boundary Condition, and there's also a video which should be pretty easy to find. I don't know if I have a link to that, but if I do, I'll put it up there. Uh, basically, this is just a bunch of pictures. It's a bunch of sketches, uh, schematics, that um, Eric drew out by hand, and it's mostly talking about the, the two-wire situation. And so here is that famous picture that you often see that I've shown in many of my videos showing the dielectric lines of force and the magnetic circular lines of force. But this picture also shows a zoom in of the cross section between the dielectric and the magnetic. Um, and he's drawing more field lines there because obviously there aren't just a few field lines. There's a whole lot of field lines. And, and the closer you get to the intersection between the dielectric and the magnetic, the straighter the lines are going to look. The straighter the lines are going to look. So the closer you look to this intersection, the straighter the lines are going to look. Yes, I know Ken Wheeler says there are no straight lines in nature, but the closer you look to the cross-section of these lines, the straighter the lines are going to look. In a similar manner, the closer we get to the, um, the lines that are touching the dielectric, that are, that are connecting the charges, or the wires in this case, the closer we get to that, the straighter the lines are going to look. And that is basically all I'm saying, all I was saying in um, my Steinmetz videos, that uh, orthogonality means 90 degrees. And 90 degrees means this is straight relative to the tangent of this circle here. So um, this picture comes up again and again. And there are all kinds of other things, uh, schematics in here ha that he drew. This is the tra the transient, transient. Okay, this is uh, the transient change in power over time, over distance, and over time, and other things. And so I had to look at this in great detail. I just studied it for a while. And again, it really shows the incommensurability between the dielectric and the magnetic, between the inductance and the capacitance. Um, this is really quite interesting. Go away. Um, section two, what's this? Um, yeah, so he's basically, this is a super, super compressed information here. Everything we need to know is in here. You've got the uh, magnetic permeability and the dielectric, um, the you know the dielectric permittivity, which are incommensurate to each other. There's the dielectric. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this, but um, just uh, if you're interested in seeing the math, he he basically rewrites Maxwell's equations in terms. Let me go to the end here. 
in terms of in terms that the electrical en engineer would find useful in terms of there's Maxwell equations here but they're written in terms of um, of the impedance of free space and the velocities and permittivity and permeability and propagation rates. Um, so when you're setting up a transmission line, a power transmission line, these are the equations that you're going to use. You're going to find these ones very useful to know how long should the length of wire be and, you know, what is the voltage going to be and what's the displacement bet current between the lines and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, so, I, you know, I've been studying this for a bit. And uh, what else? I've been investigating the idea of, oh, let me just switch to, where am I here? Right, so I'm still interested in the black holes and um, the ferrocell and the fact that this is an image I made where the, I did a ferrocell image that looks very much like the black hole image. Now the line of thinking I'm using here is that um, basically I'm imagining that space itself is a kind of a ferrofluid in that these electron-positron pairs, these vortex and vortex pairs that I say, you know, fill the medium that are make up the medium for the prop propagation of light um, would act like a ferrofluid. It would act like a ferrocell in the projection of the black hole towards our eyes. And so, you know, I think the reason why these images look so similar is because the physics is very similar between these two things. And space can be thought of as a kind of a, ferro, a ferrofluid, um, a suspension um, in space is a ferrofluid suspension, um, very much like a ferrofluid. So if you look at, up the definition of a ferrofluid and what it's made of, and I'll probably make a video on that someday, but I just wanted to give you uh, an idea of my line of thinking, where I'm going with all this. Okay, and then again, this is a picture uh, figure that I made. These I took these two pictures. This is the ferrocell and the dielectric inertial plane, and this is the ferrocell from the perspective of the North Pole. And this is an image that I found from a video showing uh, black hole simulations from various different views. And I thought it was interesting that I was able to that this is one of the views that they expect to find in their simulations. By they, I mean the relativists. Uh, they expect this picture, and they expect this picture, and they match up quite nicely <clears throat> with the ferrocell images that you see here. Um, all right. I'm also looking into the relationship between black holes and fluid dynamics and fluid electrodynamics or fluid dynamics as it relates to electromagnetic um, fields. And um, so, you know, there's all kinds of people working on this. And so I'm studying that a little bit here and there. And uh, if you look at fluid, I just want to clear this up because a lot of people get confused when they hear about fluid dynamics and they think that fluid dynamics is about fluids and, and it's really not. So let's, um, Let's read this definition from Wikipedia here. It says, in physics and engineering, fluid dynamics is a subdiscipline of fluid mechanics that describes the flow of fluids, that is, liquids and gases. Okay, so fluids don't have to just be about, you know, like water or, you know, some... Um, you know, normal fluid that we're used to dealing with. It can also um, apply to gases, and you know, it can also apply to like something like glass, which appears to be a solid, but it's also a kind of a fluid. And so, um, so there's several sub-disciplines, including aerodynamics and hydrodynamics. Um, so it's got a lot of applications for, you know, in, in, the, in many fields of science and predicting weather patterns and understanding 
nebula formation in interstellar space and modeling weapons, you know, explosions and stuff. So fluid dynamics is more than just about fluids. It's about flow. It really should be called flow dynamics. And that is probably the term I'm going to use so as not to confuse anyone because wind can flow and blow, but wind can, wind can flow and water can flow and even glass can flow. And so there's, you know, fluid dynamics isn't just about one thing. Okay. So, um, here's another a video I want you guys to watch. It's, uh, about energy flow. Speaking of flow, um, the video is called energy doesn't flow the way you think by this guy, the science asylum, the science asylum. I'll leave the link for you in, in the description, but this is probably this, this, uh, video blew my mind and it blew his mind too, but I won't, uh, I won't spoil the punchline of this video, but I really think you should watch this video. Uh, it's super, super important. And yeah, that's about it. That's what I've been up to. Um, you know, before I, you know, finish this video, I just want to give you a quick demo of um, a software program that I wrote quite a while ago. I might have demoed it for you before, I'm not sure, but um, this is really just for fun. I brushed it off and tweaked it up a little bit, but it's basically the same program. And what you can do is you can use this to fly into the Mendelbrot set. Okay, and so this target here, this target here is really like my joystick. And if I go right, it goes right. If I go left, it goes left. And I can zoom into any region of the Mendelbrot set that I want. And so I can zoom in manually if I want. Or I can use this and, and zoom in. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a full zoom in. I'm going to zoom in until I can't zoom in anymore. And because this is so CPU intensive, it's very, it takes a lot of iterations to do each image. It's even kind of a miracle that I can fly into it the way I am. Um, so, but when I go to the top part here of the Mendelbrot set, it doesn't take as many iterations. So I can go, I can fly in pretty quickly and, uh, and get to the end. So, um, so what this picture for over here is, is for, for picking up colors. So let's say if I want to change this color, and I'm pretty sure I see orange here, I think that if I change this region of the palette here, I'm going to change those colors here. And so I'm going to maybe change it to yellow and maybe change the color just a little bit. Yep, that worked. And so, uh, or if I don't like those colors, I can maybe, I like purple and green better. So I can pick up colors in here. And so, oh, that looks nice. So I can, you know, quickly change the color that I'm zooming in with. And um, as I zoom in, another part of this that's really interesting is as I zoom in, so this is my color palette. So for each iteration, or sorry, for each point on the complex plane takes a certain number of iter iterations to reach the escape condition. And depending on how many iterations it takes, uh, I painted a certain color. And so the further I zoom in here, the further I zoom in, and by zooming in, in order to zoom in, I have to shrink the measuring stick. I have to shrink the pixel, basically. I have to divide the pixel so I can I can zoom in further. And so um, the pixels are going off the edge of my picture here, over here, and over here um, as I zoom in. So the pixels are getting smaller and smaller and smaller as I zoom in. And eventually the pixels get so, well, it's not the pixels, they're not the pixels on the screen, but the voxel size. So the size, the um, size of the pixel relative to the original image 
um, get smaller and smaller. So the pixels on the screen don't get smaller, but the dimensionality, I guess you could say, of the pixels get smaller and smaller and smaller as I zoom in. So you, you can imagine that I'm zooming into, let's say I'm zooming into an atom here. So as I zoom in, I can see more and more and more details. Okay, so now something funny is happening. Now something strange is happening. What happened here is I ran out of digits of precision on my computer. So I ran, it literally ran into the brick wall. It almost looks like a brick wall now. There's my bricks. Okay, I no longer can shrink the pixels because uh, because this was written in 32-bit, I only have 17 digits of precision. So I, and two of those are uncertain. So I really only have 15 digits of precision, which is 10 to the minus 15, which is literally approximately the size of a proton. So I literally zoomed in to the same dimensionality as the proton from this dimension down to where I zoomed. So let's say this dimension is the size of a human being, the size of me. I zoomed in to 10 to the minus 15 from this scale, which is like zooming in to the atom, zooming in to the proton. Um, but in, in terms of scale, that's, that's what I've done here. So, you know, we saw a lot of, of, you know, we saw a lot of shapes on our journey. And I can zoom in anywhere. I could zoom in over here. I could surf this edge here, which looks really cool. I can record, so I can start recording. I can record these sequences. Yeah, I'm sure I've shown this before, but I just thought it would be fun to show it again. Okay, I can record the sequence and then I can preview it. I can preview it. Hopefully it won't crash. Sometimes it crashes. Okay, I can preview it. Oh, it didn't crash. Good. And then, you know, if I want to, I can make a movie. So when I make a movie, what it does is it generates higher resolution images. Uh, a sequence of higher resolution images which I can then import into some other software and create a movie um, with that. Maybe an animation to music which I've done um, which you've probably seen on my YouTube channel. So, uh, so that's about it. Uh, this is a pretty simple program. I can actually give you this program if somebody wants it. I can put it up uh, link it up somewhere for you and you can try it out. It's pretty simple. I wrote it, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, a long time ago. And it's a Windows program, not a Mac program. Even though I am running it on a Mac, uh, I use Parallel, a program called Parallel to run Windows on my Mac. So I can have the better of both worlds. I can have my Mac and I can have my my PC. So I'm a PC programmer. I program on the, on Windows. That's just what I'm used to. I've programmed on the Mac before, but um, I don't do it as often. I'm not as familiar, so it takes me a little longer, but I'm pretty good um, with, uh, with anything Windows. And so, you know, this program is pretty robust. It should run on most Windows computers. So... Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. This is fun. Oh, another thing about this program. If, uh, if I'm zooming in and I hit X, it will rotate to the right. And when I hit Z, it'll rotate to the left. But it does it really smoothly. I did it so that it doesn't, so it's not too jumpy. So when I want to change directions in a movie, when I'm making a movie, it'll, it'll look nice. So now it's going to turn to the right again. OK, 
Okay, I think I'm going to leave it at that. And, um, you know, eventually I want to... I want to start talking about the ether. I've been mapping out, um, mapping out my path to being able to uh, talk about the ether, which um, is going to require. It's going to require. Um, I'll just go to this one. It's going to require. Um, some knowledge about, or at least some uh, instincts about fluid and fluid dynamics that I was talking about before, because basically I'm saying that the ether is a kind of a fluid, that it is governed by the, you know, by the rules or laws of fluid dynamics, and that is why we have magnetic fields, and that is why, um, you know, the universe behaves the way it does. It's... Uh, if black holes can be modeled by fluid dynamics and if electromagnetism can be modeled by fluid dynamics, then why not just use fluid dynamics? So, okay, that's about it. I'm going to end this off with this guy. Ranged all my intuitions about circuits. Prepare for a mind blow. All right, prepare for a mind blow. You should really watch that video.